own up to being an atheist is tantamount to introducing yourself as Mr. Hitler or Miss Beelzebub. And that all stems from the perception of atheists as some kind of weird, way-out minority. Natalie Angier wrote a rather sad piece in The New Yorker saying how lonely she felt as an atheist. She clearly feels in a beleaguered minority. But actually, how do American atheists stack up numerically? The latest survey makes surprisingly encouraging reading. Christianity, of course, takes a massive lion's share of the population with nearly 160 million. But what would you think was the second largest group convincingly outnumbering Jews with 2.8 million, Muslims with 1.1 million, Hindus, Buddhists and all other religions put together? The second largest group with nearly 30 million is the one described as non-religious or secular. You can't help wondering why vote-seeking politicians are so proverbially overawed by the power of, for example, the Jewish lobby. The State of Israel seems to owe its very existence to the American Jewish vote, while at the same time consigning the non-religious to political oblivion. This secular non-religious vote, if properly mobilized, is nine times as numerous as the Jewish vote. Why does this far more substantial minority not make a move to exercise its political muscle? Well, so much for quantity. How about quality? Is there any correlation, positive or negative, between intelligence and tendency to be religious? <laughs> The survey that I quoted, which is the ARIS survey, didn't break down its data by socioeconomic class or education or IQ or anything else. But a recent article by Paul G. Bell in the Mensa magazine provides some straws in the wind. Mensa, as you know, is an international organization for people with very high IQ. And from a meta-analysis of the literature, Bell concludes that, I quote, of 43 studies carried out since 1927 on the relationship between religious belief and one's intelligence or educational level, all but four found an inverse connection. That is, the higher one's intelligence or educational level, the less one is likely to be religious. Well, I haven't seen the original 42 studies and I can't comment on the, that meta-analysis, but I would like to see more studies done along those lines and I know that there are, if I could put a little plug here, there are people in this audience easily capable of financing a massive research survey to settle the question. And I put the suggestion up for what it's worth. But let me now show you some data that have been properly published and analysed on one special group, namely top scientists. In 1998, Larson and Whittam polled the cream of American scientists those who have been honoured by election to the National Academy of Sciences. And among this select group, belief in a personal God dropped to a shattering 7%. About 20% are agnostic, and the rest could fairly be called atheists. The similar figures obtained for belief in personal immortality. Among biological scientists, the figure's even lower. 5.5% uh, only believe in God. In phys physical scientists, it's 7.5%. I've not seen corresponding figures for elite scholars in other fields, such as history or philosophy, but I'd be surprised if they were different. So we've reached a truly remarkable situation, a grotesque mismatch between the American intelligentsia and the American electorate. A philosophical opinion about the nature of the universe which is held by the vast majority of top American scientists and probably the majority of the intelligentsia generally, is so abhorrent to the American electorate that no candidate for popular election dare affirm it in public. If I'm right, this means that high office in the greatest country in the world is barred to the very people best qualified to hold it, the intelligentsia, unless they're prepared to lie about their beliefs. To put it bluntly, American political opportunities are heavily loaded against those who are simultaneously intelligent and honest. <laughs> I'm not a citizen of this country, so I hope it won't be thought unbecoming if I suggest that something needs to be done. <laughs> 
and I've already hinted what that something is. From what I've seen of TED, I think this may be the ideal place to launch it. Again, I fear it will cost money. We need a consciousness-raising, coming-out campaign for American atheists. <laughs> this could be similar to the campaign organized by homosexuals a few years ago, although heaven forbid that we should stoop into public outing of people against their will. In most cases, people who out themselves will help to destroy the myth that there is something wrong with atheists. On the contrary, they'll demonstrate that atheists are often the kinds of people who could serve as decent role models for your children. The kinds of people an advertising agent could use to recommend a product. The kinds of people who are sitting in this room. There should be a snowball effect, a positive feedback, such that the more names we, we have, the more we get. There could be non-linearities, threshold effects, when a critical mass has been obtained, there's an abrupt acceleration in recruitment. And again, it will need money. I suspect that the word atheist itself contains or remains a stumbling block, far out of proportion to what it actually means, and a stumbling block to people who otherwise might be happy to out themselves. So what other words might be used to smooth the path, oil the wheels? sugar the pill. Darwin himself preferred agnostic, and not only out of loyalty to his friend Huxley, who coined the term. Darwin said, I have never been an atheist in the same sense of denying the existence of a god. I think that generally an agnostic would be the most correct description of my state of mind. He even became uncharacteristically tetchy with Edward Aveling. Aveling was a militant atheist who failed to persuade Darwin to accept the dedication of his book on atheism, incidentally giving rise to a fascinating myth that Karl Marx tried to dedicate Das Kapital to Darwin, which he didn't. It was actually Edward Aveling. What happened was that Aveling's mistress was Marx's daughter. And when both Darwin and Marx were dead, Marx's papers became muddled up with Aveling's papers. And a letter from Darwin saying, my dear sir, thank you very much, but I don't want you to dedicate your book to me, was mistakenly supposed to be addressed to Marx. And th that gave rise to this whole myth, which you've probably heard, it's a sort of urban myth, that the Marx tried to dedicate capital to Darwin. Anyway, it was Aveling, and when they met, Darwin challenged Aveling. Why do you call yourselves atheists? Agnostic, retorted Aveling, was simply atheist writ respectable, and atheist was simply agnostic writ aggressive. But Darwin complained, but why should you be so aggressive? Darwin thought that atheism might be well and good for the intelligentsia, but that ordinary people were not, quote, ripe for it. Which is, of course, our old friend, the don't rock the boat argument. It's not recorded whether Aveling told Darwin to come down off his high horse. <laughs> But in any case, that was more than a hundred years ago. You think we might have grown up since then. Now, a friend, an intelligent lapsed Jew, who incidentally observes the Sabbath for reasons of cultural solidarity, describes himself as a tooth fairy agnostic. He won't call himself an atheist because it's in principle impossible to uh, prove a negative, but agnostic on its own might suggest that God's existence was therefore on equal terms of likelihood as his non-existence. So my friend is strictly agnostic about the tooth fairy, but it isn't very likely, is it? Like God. Hence the phrase tooth fairy agnostic. Bertrand Russell made the same point using a hypothetical teapot in orbit about Mars. You strictly have to be agnostic about whether there is a teapot in orbit about Mars, but that doesn't mean you treat the likelihood of its existence as on all fours with its non-existence. The list of things which we strictly have to be agnostic about doesn't stop at tooth fairies and teapots, it's infinite. If you want to believe one particular one of them, unicorns or tooth fairies or teapots or Yahweh, the onus is on you to say why. The onus is not on the rest of us to say why not. We who are atheists are also a-fairyists and a-teapotists. <laughs> but we don't bother to say so. And this is why my friend uses 
uh, tooth fairy agnostic as a label for what most people would call atheist. Nonetheless, if we want to attract deep down atheists to come out publicly, we're going to have to find something better to stick on our banner than tooth fairy or teapot agnostic. So how about humanist? This has the advantage of a worldwide network of well-organized associations and journals and things already in place. My problem with it is only its apparent anthropocentrism. One of the things we've learned from Darwin is that the human species is only one among millions of cousins, some close, some distant. And there are other possibilities like naturalist, but that also has problems of confusion because Darwin would have thought naturalist uh, nat naturalist means, of course, as opposed to supernaturalist, and it's, it, it is used sometimes. Darwin would have been confused by the other sense of naturalist, which he was, of course, and I suppose there might be others who would confuse it with, with nudism. Um, <laughs> such, people, such people might be those belonging to the British lynch mob, which last year attacked a paediatrician in mistake for a paedophile. <laughs> I think the best of the available alternatives for atheist is simply non-theist. It lacks the strong connotation that there's definitely no God.